All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I hope you all had a good break. Uh, and as I mentioned before, I hope you all held close to you the information that we discussed last class uh, about the innate immune system. Uh, today, we're going to switch gears and we're going to be talking today about uh, adaptive immunology. And we'll be talking about that in the context of uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, interestingly, there's actually uh, a, a fish called a hagfish that only has an adaptive immunology system, just kind of as, a, as an aside, it has no innate immune system. And part of its defense mechanism is secreting this, this slime uh, that helps protect it. Thankfully, we don't, we don't possess that capability. Uh, so Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, it's an acute autoimmune polyneuropathy. What that means is that it's an autoimmune disease that recognizes self as foreign, and it has many neurological problems. And it's the most common form of flaccid paralysis. Uh, if you guys remember, we talked about that before with botulism. Some of the symptoms associated with Guillain-Barre or GBS is uh, pins and needles and nerve pain. Uh, it is also associated with severe muscle pain and difficulty with muscle contraction. Uh, it's also associated with unstable uh, walking, difficulty with eye movement, facial movement, speaking, chewing, and also with some of the autonomic functions, uh, heart rate and blood pressure, body temperature, as well as difficulty with breathing. The progression of uh, Guillain-Barre is described as there's an acute infection that usually precedes the uh, symptoms that are associated with it. And then there's a progressive phase that over the course of the four weeks, th this flaccid paralysis or these polyneuropathies begin to develop. It'll then plateau over the course of a few days. And then what's usually pretty unpredictable is this resolution phase that can last from months to a year and in some subsets of patients can actually last out to a few years. Because some of these neuropathies that are associated with Guillain-Barre syndrome can be so similar to what other diseases, how they present, it can be really difficult to diagnose Guillain-Barre. And so because of that, uh, the, it, it, can, it, it has a differential diagnosis where it's often hard, hard to distinguish it from some of these other diseases like botulism we talked about the plas the flaccid paralysis with heavy metal intoxication like lead poisoning myasthenia gravis polio or uh, tick infection the ideology of Guillain-Barre it's usually caused by a bacterial infection that's most often Campylo bacteria jejuno or jejuni or C jejuni is oftentimes the way it's typically referenced and its pathogenesis is that it, again, it's an autoimmune disease that recognizes self as foreign. And the self that it's recognizing as foreign is our Schwann cells. And so our Schwann cells are part of our peripheral nervous system. You guys may have already talked about this in physiology that help with the myelination of our peripheral nerves. And so what ends up happening is that that myelination is damaged and it impedes our peripheral nerve uh, con uh, conduction across those peripheral nerves. And that helps to explain some of the difficulty with some of the, the difficulties associated with those different polyneuropathies. So before we take a deep dive into adaptive immunology, I wanna take a moment to try and define some terms that we're gonna be using here that we've already touched on, but will be helpful given that we've, we've had a week off. So as I've already said, I think a few times now, autoimmune diseases, and I think many of you already, uh, already understand this pretty well, that autoimmune diseases are when we recognize self as, when the, rec when the self is recognized as foreign. Um, and that self is oftentimes an antigen. Uh, an antigen is any substance, whether, whether it's proteins uh, or, or different glycoproteins or uh, different nucleotides, that, uh, anything, that a substance that's capable of inducing some sort of immune response. An autoantigen is that self antigen uh, or self protein that's recognized as an antigen uh, during the course of an autoimmune disease. So whenever you hear autoantigens, you can immediately know that that's auto self as being recognized as some sort of antigen that's eliciting an immune response. And this is the next important part, epitopes. We talked about earlier before the difference between antigen and epitopes. Uh, 
epitopes are the part of an antigen that elicits that response. Uh, and you can have many epitopes on an antigen. So for example, if, uh, for example, if my hand was an antigen, like for lack of a better phrase, if my hand was, if I was microscopic and my hand was like something that was floating in your, in your body, you know, there's different epitopes potentially that can be recognized. My middle finger, ring, pinky, thumb, like those are all different epitopes, but this is the entire antigen, the entire substance, the entire thing that has many different epitopes. So antibodies are proteins that can bind tightly to specific epitopes. They're incredibly specific. And we talked before about pattern recognition receptors in the, adapt in the innate immune system. Antibodies are typically not recognizing general patterns, but rather very specific epitopes, but very specific amino acid sequences usually that are used to identify something and help with its elimination. Anaphylaxis, we talked about this with the complement system really briefly, but anaphylaxis is a really large systemic allergic reaction. So there are lo local allergic reactions where maybe uh, your, your tongue gets a little fuzzy or maybe you have some hives on your skin, but anaphylaxis is a systemic wide uh, reaction where your body temperature drops, your blood pressure uh, begins to drop severely, and you begin to go in, you can go into shock where your blood is literally not able to perfuse organs sufficiently and you, begin, you can go into organ failure. And so anaphylaxis, when we hear that, just think of a large systemic reaction. And proliferation, it's something that we've talked about or referenced in other instances, but it's important for us to define it, particularly with the cells that we're gonna be discussing today in adaptive immunology. Proliferation is when cells divide, when you go from one, one single cell to many cells, when you get more, more copies of that cell. And what's equally important is the, the concept of differentiation. Um, that's typically when a cell that is, uh, it can be a stem cell or it can be uh, some of the immune cells we're gonna discuss that are usually naive or not active or not ready to become an effector cell quite yet, but they're inactive and they can become activated and become far more specialized to have a very specific function. And so in a couple of the pre-lectures that we've had so far, there's this tree of cells, basically, hematopoiesis, that big scary word that might seem a little intimidating but it's the shows the lineages of different immune cells. And so if you start at the top, the hematopoietic stem cell, as you go down, it's differentiating to very specific cells that have very specific functions. Are there any questions yet about any of these terms? All right. So this is a slide you guys have already seen a few times, but it's worth Sorry, forgive me. Uh, it's worth in introducing again, particularly in the context of, of adaptive immunology. So we talked about the diversity that exists within our immune system. With adaptive immunology, when you compare it to the innate, it's far more diverse because there's far more, uh, there are far more antigens that our immune, that our adaptive immune cells are capable of responding to. So everything that we, these three main points, Everything with adaptive immunology, is, it's more exaggerated when compared to innate immunology. Uh, the specificity, our adaptive immune cells are incredibly more specific. Rather than looking at general patterns that, we, that are recognized with innate immunology, adaptive immune cells are far more specific. Rather than just looking at general patterns, they're looking at specific amino acid sequences usually. And the memory, when we talked about uh, the memory in innate immunology, it's generally this kind of like over the course of evolution that we've developed the ability to remember these patterns that typically are associated with bacteria or typically associated with viruses. But the memory with adaptive immunology is that there are cells that actually, that when they respond to a specific antigen, those cells will linger around and be around for the rest of our lives with, within our body and within our bloodstream so that they might be poised to respond when it is encountered again. <clears throat> Excuse me. So to further break down the immune system, we've talked about, we, we, we know that we have the innate immune, immune system, the adaptive immune system, but like before we talked about humoral immunity and cell-mediated immunity. Humoral, again, we talked about this before, humoral immunity is 
Humoral is the term for body fluid. And so usually when we talk about humoral immunity, we're talking about in our blood. So before for the innate immune system, we talked about how the complement system is the innate humoral system and that the cell mediated innate immune system, there are different cells that engulf pathogens through what we call phagocytosis. Phago eating, cytosis cells, the process of cells eating things. In adaptive immunity, the humoral response is typically with antibodies that are binding to pathogens to either inactivate them or to target them for elimination. And the cell mediated response we're gonna talk about later is gonna be particularly cells that are gonna be focused on targeting infected cells, cancerous cells, or uh, coordinating general help and assistance with eliminating some sort of pathogen. So in our adaptive immune response, we typically call those cells lymphocytes. Uh, when you look at the hematopoiesis tree in our pre-lecture, everything that's usually associated with the adaptive immune system comes from what we call the common lymphoid progenitor. So whenever you hear lymphoid, think adaptive immune system. So well, the first cell that we're going to discuss is the B cell. B cells are the chief cells that we associate with antibody production. And so when they're activated, they will differentiate into plasma cells, which are our professional antibody producing cells. They will also participate in the antigen presentation. And we're going to talk about more of that, what that means today. But they will bind to an antigen that they're specific to and then display it to other cells so that they might, that it might find the cell that recognizes that specific antigen as well. And so B cells are the key component of adaptive humoral immunity because they, when they differentiate into plasma cells, they pump out tons of antibodies. In the pre-lecture, there was an electron micrograph image of a B cell versus a plasma cell. And when it becomes a plasma cell, it gets way more uh, rough ER because it is equipping itself to just make tons and tons of antibodies. The key cell mediated component of the adaptive immune response is the T cell. Uh, T cells coordinate their responses by direct cell to cell contact. They'll bind to, if they, there's some of them that are poised to try and find either infected cells or cancerous cells. And once they find them, they'll actually deliver toxins or actually deliver uh, these perforins actually like poke holes in the cancerous or infected cell to lice and destroy that cell. Or sometimes it might induce a more elegant response to target that cell by inducing apoptosis. And there's a subset of T cells that we'll talk about, hopefully we'll get to today, that modulate the immune response are called regulatory T cells. So kind of put a pin there because those are, uh, that's like a new, or a really exciting area of research that people are diving into more and more. So antigen receptors. Uh, we're gonna talk about different types of antigen receptors. And as the name implies, these are receptors that bind to antigens. So both the humoral and cell media responses, the B cells and the T cells, both rely on antigen receptors to, do, to carry out their functions. As the, name as the name implies, an antigen receptor is a receptor whose ligand is an antigen. It binds to antigens. This is the really important distinction between adaptive immunology and innate immunology. Innate immunology recognizes specific patterns and it can bind to different, it can bind to different pathogens if it possesses that pattern. Here in adaptive immunology, it, an immune cell will express one and only one antigen receptor. It'll have thousands of copies of it, but it only has that one variation of that antigen receptor. Antibodies are one class of antigen receptors. So for B cells, they will actually have membra membrane bound antibodies and that's the B cell receptor. T cells, if you imagine, so a B cell will have what looks like an uh, antibody on its surface for a T cell, I'll say T here for, ah, no, sorry, B cell, forgive me. For the T cell, it's gonna look more like this, but this part doesn't exist. So it's like one segment of the antibody that's its antigen receptor. They're the same, basically some of the same structures, but the 
a full structured antibody is on the surface of a B cell making up its B cell receptor. And lymphocyte activation results when, a, when it encounters the cognate antigen for its receptor. So what that means is, as we've discussed already, antibodies are incredibly specific. And each lymphocyte has one and only one receptor, thousands of copies of it all across the surface, but only one antigen receptor. And as, that, as you can imagine, the specificity here, it'll only recognize one and only one antigen. That, we call that the cognate antigen or like the corresponding antigen. So for example, like if, I, if, I, if each of you were a lymphocyte, if each of you were a T cell, and if the antigen here is like some birthday uh, or like a birthday month, for example, the antigen here is the month of July. Which one of you has a birthday in July? Okay, you guys would be lymphocytes. I'd be recognizing that antigen uh, for the month of April. Anybody birthday in April? You guys are the lymphocytes that would recognize the cognate an that would recognize the cognate antigen. Twelve chance here because we have we have approximately one trillion lymphocytes that can respond to a wide variety of antigens here. But despite this really wordy, wordy slide here, the main take home message here is that all of, of the antigen receptors that our lymphocytes express, they express one and only one. They have thousands of them on their surface, but they correspond to one and only one cognate or corresponding antigen. Are there any questions there? Yes. you'll have basically receptors all over you that recognize that they'll respond to like April antigens basically. Um, and so like, even though it, it can be confusing to hear one and only one and think of like, okay, there's just like one receptor on the surface here. I'm pretty sure this is the number. There are 20,000 of these on the surface. The likelihood of finding, uh, of binding to its Are there any, I, 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 want to, I want to have at least two more questions. Yeah. Thousands of copies of that one receptor that will recognize only one antigen. you're asking a good question that pinned there. The question was, can B cells present multiple, present multiple antigens? Was that your question? So the answer is yes. So uh, I'll, I'll briefly say what happened. So it binds to an antigen. It is endocytosed, broken up into pieces, and then that will present those pieces cell that recognizes it. But I don't, I don't, the main, the main, but I want to put in it and not uh, confuse what the focus is here. Yes, they can present multiple antigens, but uh, just put a pin in there. All right, we'll keep moving. And so if anything, I, I think I've said this only once, but I want this to kind of be uh, at least a mantra that I tell myself and that I want to kind of empower you guys. If something doesn't make sense, that's not on you. That's on me for not explaining it properly enough. So. If something doesn't make sense, please feel free to say that, especially with adaptive immunology. We talked about, I mentioned how it's slow but smart. That smart part of it can make it really complex. But if we take a step back and look at the big picture and try and make sure that we kind of have the big picture and can hold that in our hands, it'll make everything else with adaptive immunology a little bit easier to understand. So we talked before about antibodies. And so antibodies, have typically, they're a tetrapeptide, so they have four pieces. They have two light chains, 
and two heavy chains. Ah, that's wrong. Uh, as the drawn here, as you can imagine, the small pieces are the light chains, and actually looks more like this. Uh, we have two light chains and two heavy chains, uh, and they're both they're and they're both identical to one another. And so, what's also important to know is that the light chain and the heavy chain have pieces of it that we call variable and constant. So the variable region is part of the FAB or the antigen binding domain. And that kind of makes sense because you want the, the antigen binding part is where you want the variability so you can bind to lots of different kinds of antigens. Uh, the leg is called the FC domain. This is where it can get a little confusing. It's typically also called the constant domain. But what I've always found helpful is that I always think of FC as the cell binding domain because usually, kind of like back here, if we look at the uh, antibody on the B cell, uh, that's the portion that will usually, if it's membrane bound, it'll either bind to an antibody receptor or membrane bound here. And so like, if it's stuck to a cell, the FC domain is the cell part that's gonna be wedged up there. And the antigen domain above, now, I'll push pause there. So again, the antigen binding domain has both a light chain and a heavy chain. And in addition to that, there's the, so there's a variable region here the on, the top, on the top half and a constant region on the bottom half. And so the variable domain is where things can change and it can, in the specificity for what it binds to uh, can, uh, that, that's how that process works. The variable domain is what's changed. So because antibodies can be multivalent, meaning they can bind to multiple antigens, they can actually cross-link and form these complexes together. So what that means is, yes. So that, that's a good question. So what it means is that they're multivalent, meaning that both arms bind to antigen. Does that make sense? Each, each uh, they're both capable of binding to an antigen, and what that means is that typically, if the antigen is large enough, we can have that epitope in multiple places. For example, like if this is an allergen whether it's pollen or house dust mite, if the allergen is large enough uh, to this single antibody can bind to uh, the antigen multiple times, but if that same epitope is available that it recognizes, if that makes sense. And so typically we'll have, we'll have these complexes with antibodies will bind, antibody will bind to this part and this antibody will bind multiple antigens to Typically, what will happen is when we're forming these complexes, have this arm bound to here, and you'll have, let me start over. You'll typically have two. And the same epitope won't be available for both arms to bind. Perhaps here, this is, you know, what ends up happening is that maybe sometimes you'll have different antibodies that recognize different parts of it. And so, for example, this is 
blood being a really simplified antigen with antibodies that can bind to it multiple times here. But in real life, you might have an antibody here that recognizes this part. This antibody will recognize this part of it. And then maybe the, we'll have more than, we'll have multiple antibodies around that can bind to form a compound. Like, uh, and sheath it in an antibody casing, basically, so that uh, immune cells can recognize the FC domain, be activated, and destroy whatever the antigen is. Like, this is a not biologically or not physiologically relevant example here, rather just to be an illustration of how immune complexes can form. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so A, B, antigen binding. C, historically C is constant, which is confusing because there's also variable and constant. So for me, what I always, whenever I was working with immune cells and working with antibodies, I always kind of, in my own mind, thought of FC as cell, uh, because that's oftentimes, there are, for example, I'll, I'll keep coming back to this example, Mast cells are an, are an immune cell that are associated with allergies. They have an IgE receptor. IgE is one of the classes of antibodies. And so for them, uh, the IgE receptor binds to the FC domain. And so the antibody will be like this. There'll be two of them on the, on the IgE receptor and they'll cross link together on some sort of allergen. They'll release histamines and you'll have an allergic response. So like this is an example where the cross linking is really important because both of those IgEs put together and binding to this allergen will, again, binding to something will change its uh, conformation and elicit downstream signaling that says release histamine and every, everything else in our granules. And so the FC domain is what binds. Macrophages have IgG receptors where the FC domain binds to the receptor. And so what's important, the important the FAB, the antigen binding domain, binds to the antigen. The FC domain typically binds to cells so that they can elicit some sort of uh, cell mediated response that can attack whatever it, the antigen is bound to. I said a lot there. Are there any questions? Yes. I can't speak to neutrophils or basophils, but masks typically will release like 95% of their granular content. And so, you know, when you have an allergic reaction and it's so fast, it's because mast cells will pump out histamine, uh, inflammatory cytokines, and different lipid mediators that will then activate everything really quickly. You'll get edema, you'll get itching. And so like, that's why like degranulation is a very, but uh, the takeaway, at least maybe to relate it back to what we're discussing here, is that it's the cross-linking of these two IgEs that recognize this allergen that permits some sort of uh, downstream event. So the formation of these immune complexes, whether it's in the context of allergy, whether it's in the context of covering some antigen that is encountered, it's really important. And also in a research context, if we wanna pull down whatever that protein is, we can introduce antibodies that recognize that protein and we can actually pull it out of solution and just spin it down. And so the, the ability for antibodies to form these complexes around things has both really important biological relevance as well as research relevance. And as we discussed before, the ability for these antibodies to cover and form complexes around things is important for the activation of the complement system. We talk, when we talked about the classical pathway was where antibodies were covered across the surface of whatever that bacterium or pathogen is. And then that would permit the uh, docking of that spaceship-like complex uh, with the C1 proteins. Um, also, what's important is that it can help promote phagocytosis. I mentioned before that different immune cells will have different antibody receptors. Macrophages and neutrophils have IgG receptors, 
we're going to talk about the different classes of antibodies in a moment. I'm, I, I keep saying IG something as if it's common knowledge, but I promise you, if you hold tight, we'll get to it in like three slides, I think. Uh, but macrophages and neutrophils are known to have IgG receptors. And so, and if, for example, these antibodies on our slide here, if those were IgG antibodies and they bound to some sort of antigen, they would, uh, over time, macrophage, macrophages might, come, might make their way to this immune complex. Because, and what's important here is that big macro molecular immune complex makes it easier to find antibodies that have bound to some sort of antigen. Because if it's one single antibody floating around that's bound to an antigen, that's a lot harder to find a large macromolecular complex of antibodies around an antigen. And so macrophages and uh, or degranulation of granulocytes, as I discussed here, where for new mast cells and eosinophils, uh, when they're degranulated, you'll get some sort of allergic reaction. For neutrophils, they'll release a ton of enzymes to try and destroy whatever it is that they've encountered. Are there any questions there? Yes. So in the last lecture in innate, uh, innate immunology, the humoral component we talked about, the part that's in the bloodstream, was the complement system. And there are three different pathways that we talked about. One of them, the classical pathway, is triggered by antibodies covering the surface of some, of some sort of region. And those antibodies complexes of antibodies or a pathogen to be complex. To pro promote phagocytosis or promote degranulation. And so it depends. Each class of antibodies has different things, each different outcome. Does this feel like a fire hose effect right now? There's a lot of information all at once. So, again, if something doesn't make sense, please raise your hand and let me know. So uh, the activation of non-lymphocytes, those are non-adaptive immune cells uh, in response to antibodies. So the antibodies, it's actually kind of backwards. Uh, typically what will happen is in the context of mast cells, just because I think mast cells are really cool. Most immunologists don't, they're wrong. Mast cells are cool. Typically what will happen is we'll have specific kinds of antibodies that are bound to the surface of a mast cell or bound to other cells. Once, once they bind to the antigen and they're cross-linked, they're physically associating together in response to binding to their uh, allergen and there's a conformational change. It will elicit downstream activation that promotes degranulation here. Uh, for macrophages and neutrophils, those cells will bind to antibodies that already have antigen bound to them. And that's like, as well as cytokine release and other forms of activation. So the antibody classes. We have five different classes of antibodies. The IG just stands for immunoglobulin. Uh, that's the long uh, precursor name for antibodies. That's like the general term for antibodies but we have five different classes of antibodies. IgG is the bulk of the kind of class of antibodies that we have in our bodies. And it consists of approximately 20% of the protein in our serum. The next class is IgD. Uh, IgD is typically the class of antibody that serves as the B cell receptor. Uh, there's two different classes that can be the B cell receptor. One of them is IgD. The other is IgM. So there's two important things to know about IgM. One is that it can be uh, the B cell receptor, the class of antibody that's the B cell receptor, or what's also very true is that when we 
have antibodies that are made in response to some sort of new pathogen, I have antibodies that are made. Now, what will typically happen is in response to subsequent exposures like a booster, they'll class switch to have better affinity and IgG. And so typically IgM is the first one made and then we'll get IgG after that. But the important thing to know here right now is that IgD and IgM are the two classes that comprise of our B cell receptors. Additionally, we also have IgA. Uh, IgA is usually the antibodies that are associated with mucosal antigens and mucosal immune, uh, immunology. And finally, IgE is a class that binds to mast cells that triggers granulation. And so IgE is far less abundant in our bloodstream because usually they're already on our allergy associated immune cells. And so usually in terms of abundance, the trick I always learned was that it's G made. Uh, that in G, M, A, B, E. That is really not coming through. I apologize. Let's try that one more time. <laughs> there we go. G, G made. And this kind of makes sense if you think about how we'll switch to and become a set of affinity. Their first mate is IgM, IgA is on our mucosal surfaces, and typically IgD is on our B cell surfaces. IgE is for allergic responses. And so G made is to help you remember kind of the abundance, the relative abundance of different antibodies. Are there any questions there so far? Yes. Hundred percent, yes. That's exactly right. Those are the two locations, or in our mucosal surfaces for IgA, uh, but they're either cell membrane bound or free floating in our bloodstream, or uh, also uh, can also pass can they can cross the placenta and to, and also be delivered in breast milk. But for simplicity's sake, blood and cell membrane bound. Are there any questions? Are there any other questions? All right. So, you know, we have the differences of these different antibodies, but it's also, their structure is also very different. So typically IgG can exist as a monomer, as, as a single antibody free floating in our blood. IgM, IgM can actually exist as a pentamer uh, where the, there's a, a linking protein that connects the FC domain to uh, each of these different IgMs. And so that'll permit uh, these, that's when it's not uh, cell membrane bound. I, again, IgM and IgD can either be cell membrane bound or IgM can also be in our blood. And so this kind of increases its ability to identify a different antigens. IgE is both free-floating or typically cell membrane bound, usually membrane bound, and IgA is typically in our mucosal surfaces. And so each of these have a different FC domain. FC domain is the, like, the long single arm portion of it, and they each elicit different responses because different cells have receptors for them. So mast cells have receptors for IgE, uh, they have some for IgG, not a lot, but because cer certain cells have certain receptors for these different antibodies, the FC domain will elicit different, the FC domain across the different classes will elicit different responses because of that, because different cells have receptors for them. So as I mentioned earlier, it can either be cell bound or secreted. Uh, the secreted form uh, can either stick to cells in their FC receptors. So Again, like mast cells have the FC receptor for IgE. Macrophages and neutrophils have the FC receptor for IgG. So they can also be cell membrane bound. And so what that means is that the, that typically like the Ig, again, the IgM and IgD 
are bound to the B cell receptor, the B cell surface as the B cell receptor. And as we discussed previously in our very first lecture, that those that are membrane bound, as you can imagine, have a hydrophobic transmembrane domain that permit them or e equip them to be wedged in the membrane of our cells. So in summary, just to, just to cover this again, our B cells, and, their, and when they differentiate into plasma cells, plasma cells are their uh, differentiation, their one step of differentiation ahead where the plasma cells are the professional antibody producing cell. And it's our antibodies that are the main part of humoral adaptive immunity. Uh, these antibodies are really helpful in our ability to isolate and eliminate uh, specific antigens when they're encountered and the ability to promote whether it's degranulation, uh, phagocytosis uh, is mediated by cells that have receptors for those different antibodies. Are there any questions there? Let's do two questions. So how many different kinds, this is a quick quiz question. How many different kinds of antigen receptors can a T cell or B cell have? One. Can it have more than one identical copy of it on its surface? Yes. Uh, can, I'll leave it there. All right, so for the sake of time, I'll leave it there. Uh, now we're gonna move on to cell mediated immunity. And the main cell that participates an adaptive cell mediated immunity is the T cell. And it, per, it largely is able to carry out its function by direct cell to cell contact. So B cells will bind a free antigen that's floating around in the bloodstream. T cells will typically see their antigen through direct contact during that process that we've called antigen presentation. And it can either recognize and help assist in the elimination of that pathogen, or it could be something that's presented from an infected cell or a cancer cell and kill that cell that should not be around. So as I mentioned a moment ago, the antigen receptors for B cells are full antibodies that are bound to the surface that will bind to free floating antigens. T cells ha will have, have their T cell receptors that are from the same family, they look, they look like only a chunk of an antibody, only maybe like the antigen, the antigen binding domain. That's typically what the T cell receptor is. Yes? That's a great question. So it's, it's both and, both T cells and B cells, or either one, forgive me. Uh, T cells are typically the leading cell uh, the, usually the culprit. T, auto reactive T cells are usually the culprit in autoimmune diseases. But as we discussed with lupus, there are also cases where we have antibodies that recognize itself as foreign. In, in that case, it was uh, antibodies that react to nuclear proteins. And so it can, it can be either one, but usually it is oftentimes T cells that have escaped our kind of the mechanisms we have to eliminate autoreactive T cells. So as I mentioned a moment ago, T cells also have their antigen receptor, but it's only usually the, the FAB domain of an antibody that comprises of what a T cell receptor is. And they will oftentimes only be, they'll oftentimes only interact with their cognate antigen when it's been presented to them, okay? So, T cell receptors, they are also immunoglobulins, also, also antibodies in a structural sense. And just like antibodies, they can bind to very specific epitopes. Uh, and they exist, they have incredible variety because it's, it's typically easier to think of them as being basically the, the FAB domain of an antibody where all of the variability exists, all of the diversity exists of an antibody. And so the T cell receptor is basically that, and they're membrane bound, and as we discussed a moment ago with antigen receptors, each T cell only has one kind of T cell receptor. 
thousands of copies of it, but only one kind of T cell receptor. And it's the T cell receptor is how T cells recognize their antigens, just like how B cells use antibodies. Now, as I, as I mentioned a moment ago, T cells will only bind to their antigen when it's been presented to them. And the way that it's presented to them is by the use of what's called a major histocompatibility comp class or complex. Take that and just call it MHC. Uh, it's a huge mouthful. So the, the take home message here is big picture. T cells also have an antibody like receptor that's membrane bound. It possesses a lot of the same qualities of an antibody or the B cell receptor. But in this case, it's only a chunk of the antibody. So I drew this earlier. Uh, for a T cell, basically, it's just this portion here that comprises the T cell receptor. And while B cells and their B cell receptor can bind to free antigen, the T cell receptor can only bind to, an, uh, can only see an antigen when it's been presented to it by MHC on other cells. Uh, that's part of the antigen presentation when it's been presented by macrophages or B cells and dendritic cells. So just again, to repeat, this is uh, what a full IgG looks like. If we're zooming up in on its uh, FAB domain, the antigen binding domain, where there's all that variability in it, and this is what the T cell receptor looks like. So it's basically just the, the main variable domain of a single arm of an antibody. Uh, but instead of calling it light versus heavy chain, we call it alpha and beta. And so for the T cell receptor, we say it has an alpha subunit and a beta subunit. So major histocompatibility complex, or again, MHC. Uh, across all species, we, we refer to as MHC. Oftentimes in humans, we also call it HLA, human leukocyte antigen. Uh, the, the main role MHC on, uh, on different cells is that it will display uh, pieces of protein or peptide antigens to a T cell receptor. We have two kinds of MHC, MHC class one and MHC class two. The easiest way to think of this is MHC class is on all nucleated cells. And that basically means every cell, except for red blood cells, have MHC1. And each and every one of us have a different MHC1, which means it's basically the ID of a cell. So MHC1, you can think of it as like a cell's ID card. So like, my, like mine has totally different, and we each inherit copies of MHC class one from our parents. And so each and every person has a unique MHC class one. MHC class two is involved with antigen presentation, and it's only found, usually only found, on the antigen presenting cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells. And so this goes back to the question we had earlier in the class about, can B cells present more than one antigen? And so when B cells have an antigen that's bound here, the, short, the uh, shorthand for antigen is AG. That's oftentimes way easier than to write out antigen every single time. So when you have antigen bound to a B cell on its B cell receptor, it'll be endocytose. It'll enter the phagosome uh, and it'll also be broken up. And what ends up happening is that little pieces of it, of that antigen that's been engulfed, different pieces of it will now be presented on MHC class two on the B cell because it is an antigen presenting cell. And so now it's looking for the T cell that can recognize that chewed up piece of antigen, the T cell receptor that recognizes that epitope. And so MHC class two helps, is meant for professional antigen presenting cells. So that means fibroblasts usually don't express it. That means endothelial cells in our blood vessels typically don't have it. Bone cells, it's only macrophages, dendritic cells and B cells. Uh, typically in different immune journals, they'll, or someone's going to discover like a new cell that expresses MHC class two. And typically these cells express like thousands of copies of it. And they'll say like, oh, we found like one copy on a fibroblast and now it's an antigen presenting cell. So 
despite what you might read in your uh, research, if MHC class two becomes a part of, it is most helpful to just think about macrophages. There's a reason why I'm repeating this, which cells are the antigen presenting cells, just to let you know. Macrophages, dendritic cells, and B cells. Those are our antigen presenting cells that express MHC class two because MHC class two helps present antigen to our T cell, to, to T cell receptors. It's incredibly promiscuous. So while T cell receptors and B cell receptors are very specific and antigen receptors that bind to very specific antigens, MHC class one, MHC class two are very promiscuous, constantly showing things. You can think of it as like a four year old child. Hey, look what I have. Hey, look what I have. Hey, look what I have. Hey, what I have. Because MHC class one is like the ID for our cells, what it does is it's constantly assessing what is inside and saying, this is what is inside me. Is this okay? Is this okay? Is this okay? So uh, what will end up happening is that the T cells that help get rid of cancerous or infected cells will look at what's on MHC class one. Like, okay, that's right. That looks normal. You're good. That self, that self, that self. For cancerous or infected cell, for example, if our cells are infected with coronavirus, on MHC class one, there might be spike protein. And all of a sudden, the T cells that recognize that will say, there's something wrong there. Let's kill this cell. And then once that happens, you'll start having other responses that help with antibody production. But typically, MHC class one is assessing what's inside and saying, is this OK? MHC class two, macrophages, I, I've talked about how the innate immune system is fast but dumb. Macrophages and dendritic cells will gobble everything up and be like, hey, look what I have. 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 Constantly assessing is what they have being recognized by different T cells. Are there any questions there? Yes, cool. Generally on the order of thousands. Yeah. Are there any questions there? Or any other questions? All right. So on the left here, uh, we have MHC class one. And on the right, we have MHC class two. So typically on MHC class one, we'll have space to have eight to 10 amino acid, eight to 10 amino acid peptides presented. On MHC class two, it's approximately 18 to 20 amino acid peptide sequences. So as a way to kind of help illustrate it in your mind, you can imagine that in this binding pocket of MHC class one, uh, there is a standard size hot dog that's being presented there. Whereas on MHC class two, an eight to 10 amino acid long hot dog, whereas on MHC class two, it's larger. You have a Costco size foot, foot, foot long hot dog. So MHC class two is typically presenting much larger peptide antigens that is being assessed from what's been engulfed. And MHC class one is presenting smaller peptides that are from within, but constantly trying to assess, is this, is this right? Am I healthy basically? So I know you're all thinking, why should I care about MHCs? Um, as I mentioned earlier that MHC class one is a bit like an ID card for our cells. As you can imagine, those become the primary antigens during a transplant rejection. Because whenever someone gets some sort of organ transplant, they need to make sure that, uh, that there's MHC matching. And when that doesn't happen, when there's a poor match and there's still a transplant that occurs, MHC class one becomes the antigen. It becomes the immunogenic antigen there. And so MHC, MHC proteins are polygenic, which means that they are derived from multiple genes that are at play, helping to define what the MHC protein is here. And not only that, but they are polymorphic. Uh, you, in, in your research or in other classes, you might hear the term polymorphism. That typically just refers to some sort of mutation. That's all that means. Uh, it's become very much out of vogue to say mutation because that implies that there's a normal. And so polymorphism is now the term we use to imply that there's some sort of mutation. And so our MHCs, in addition to being polygenic, can have different variation, different variations that occur. 
And finally, they're also co-dominant. As with every gene, we have two copies that we uh, inherit from uh, each parent. And so both copies are at play to define what your MHC protein or your MHC allele is. So they're co-dominant, they're both at play. One's not dominant over the other. And so this becomes really important because it can become really hard, if it's a co-dominant, it can be really hard to find a, uh, a person that has an MHC class one match with you, which means you need to be very closely related like a sibling or some sort of close relative. But even then, because it can be morphic, you can have these little mutations that can easily occur. Even between siblings, it can be hard to find a match. And so that while it, is, it makes it really hard for transplant surgery, it helps with having incredible specificity to, or uniqueness to your MHC class one. And so because of this, in addition with the blood type variability, the chances of two people having the same exact alleles and the same blood type is staggeringly low outside of close relatives. Are there any questions there so far? Yes. Any other questions? If you're thinking to, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, typically, uh, what it means that there's a close enough match. So, like, there again, like this is polygenic, so that means. There are different components of MHC class one or MHC or MHC class one that uh, are controlled by these different genes. And if there's enough of, if there's similarity, I, I, I don't know what the threshold is, but if there's enough similarity, they'll you'll often hear like in movies and shows like it's a close enough match. It's because there's enough similarity or um, homology between your MHC class one and your MHC class one to be a donor, as well as blood type match. If you're thinking to yourself, this feels like a lot, it is a lot. Uh, adaptive immunology is incredibly complicated, but that's why I keep using the phrase, take a step back and think the big picture. And if you can think about the big picture about certain antigen receptors that, have, that only recognize certain things and how there's like these things are coming together, it's easier to fill in the details. So like, for example, like with complement last class, if you spend time, this is going to help you for the quiz. If you spend time memorizing each and every protein in complement cascade, kudos to you. It's not a great use of your time, but rather thinking about how the different pathways relate and what are the different outcomes that can come at the end of complement. And so with this, for example, with MHC class one, like the ability to think about not, to not remember, uh, to not go in and try and recognize, memorize every gene that's associated with it, even though we don't talk. I'm sure many of you are going to go even further into the details of this. Think about the big picture. Think about the implications of like, okay, MHC class one is a vote is I was going to say voter ID. Sorry, 
is, is, is basically like an ID card for each of our cells and how it's gonna be presenting things versus antigen presenting cells, the things they'll see and what they'll, what they'll be presenting and perhaps how could these things go wrong or what are the biology, the diseases where these things go wrong? So with antigen presented by MHC class one to a T cell receptor, we have our small eight to 10 amino acid peptide that's bound to MHC class one that's being presented to our T cell receptor that again, should resemble the FAB or antigen binding site of an antibody. The yellow portion is MHC class one. The blue is a protein that's kind of uh, assists with MHC class one. You don't need to memorize this. It's beta two microglobulin. The, the, the key thing is just to give you uh, an, a visual sense of what this interaction looks like. So this would be MHC class one, the ID version of our MHC protein presenting what's inside to the T cell receptor to get a sense. Is, is, this, is this okay? Am I good, basically? So there are lots of ways to identify different kinds of T cells. Uh, in addition to uh, variations in their T cell receptor, there's also these proteins that have uh, an alphanumeric code to it. So it can be really intimidating when we get into these different alphanumeric codes that define different immune cells. But again, if you take a step back and think about the big picture, it can, it, it can help you navigate this. So there are proteins that mark the surface of immune cells that we use to designate them. They're called cluster of differentiation proteins or CDs that help guide you. And so there's, so oftentimes it'll be CD and then a certain number. So like a lot of the research I do now is about a protein on fibroblasts called CD90. They'll oftentimes have a different protein name, or thi one And so with immune cells, it's less so the case. They stick with the alphanumeric CD and then a number, but we're only gonna introduce a few here. So I, I, that's not meant to intimidate you. The two main that I want you to focus on for T cells are CD4 and CD8. Uh, and they determine to what MHC class a T cell receptor is binding to. So CD4s are helping to stabilize MHC class two when it's binding to the T cell receptor. And so those are, we usually refer to CD4 uh, T cells as helper cells. And so typically what ends up happening is that CD4 is only found on helper cell. It is the way we define them. So like if I was using this really cool technique that I looked at every single cell and wanted to see which ones had CD4 on the surface, anyone that has CD4 on the surface is a helper T cell. It defines that, it is a protein surface marker that defines that population. And what it does is that it helps to stabilize MHC class two when it's presenting the epitope to the T cell receptor. It'll actually physically engage with MHC class two and help mediate that interaction. Um, what's also kind of, uh, but it, it won't do that with MHC class one. It cannot. It is only with MHC class two that CD4 does that. Um, what's also noteworthy is that, uh, you, many of you have probably heard this, that HIV target, every virus has a specific cell that it usually targets and that HIV targets T cells the way that it, is, it grabs onto and enters into T cells is by grabbing onto CD4. So that means that HIV is usually targeting only helper T cells, um, but these cells are so important that that is sufficient to create people who have suffered from really severe, uh, uh, an, an immunocompromised immune system. CD8 is the other, uh, population, we usually refer to them as cytotoxic T cells. Like those are usually way more fun to say than CD8 positive T cells. But as the name implies, cytotoxic, they're going and kill, they are cytotoxic, they will kill cells. And this, this is another like virtual pin. If you think about the larger story or the larger picture here, this will begin to make sense that where CD8 helps to stabilize MHC class one, uh, with the to the T cell receptor. It'll physically grab on MHC class one. Let me move this out of your way so you can appreciate it. It'll physically associate with MHC class one so that the epitope being uh, presented can bind to the T cell receptor. Now, if you think about it, for a moment, take a step back. Class one is our helping us, is helping our 
helping our cells in our cells uh, present things that are inside to get us affected by a virus. Is this a cancerous cell? And CD8 is cytotoxic. So that means if it finds an epitope that says, yes, things are wrong here, it'll kill the cell. It'll kill that cancerous cell or it'll kill that uh, virally infected cell. So when trying to think about how CD4, what CD4 binds to or what CD8 binds to, uh, thinking about the large narrative or bigger picture uh, can help. So MHC class one is the ID card of cells. If something's wrong, you'll want the cytotoxic CD8 cells to attack. Uh, if there's some sort of antigen, so bacterium or some sort of uh, allergen, you'll want the helper cell to come help with the problem. If some of you are more numbers oriented, an easy way to think about this is product of the CD number to MHC class will always be eight. Four times MHC class two, four times two, eight. Eight times MHC class one is eight. So like you can think of it as like multiplying the numbers to get a sense of like, should always be eight as the product of what the pairing is. Um, but I also wanna encourage you to think about the bigger story, the bigger picture, but that's also a shortcut to help you try and figure out which, to remember which CD class goes with which MHC class. Are there any questions there? We're almost done, I promise you. All right, I wanna, I wanna pause for two questions. I wanna hear two questions, come on. I also like dumb questions. If you're thinking to yourself, this is a dumb question. Yes. So when I, uh, that, that is a good question. When I say it's a helper cell and it helps the cell, it's not helping, it's not help. So if this is the C4 helper cell, it's not helping, it's, it's, it's helping, it is helping to address whatever the antigen or pathogen is and appropriately respond to it. Uh, usually when a cytotoxic T cell sees its cognate, it's oftentimes, something that shouldn't be there. And so the cytotoxic T cell will kill the cell that's presenting because it's from inside this cell. Um, but usually helper T cells just because there's, again, cells we currently have five subclasses of helper T cells and each subclass has specific functions and uh, general categorization of what it do, uh, what the function is thing in addressing that pathogen. Yes. I'm going to ask you to repeat that question only because I realized I did not articulate something that was embedded in your question. Uh, so while our innate immune system is evolutionarily uh, derived, for lack of a better phrase, we have a library of T cells and B cells that are made. But again, adaptive is also called acquired immunity. So they have not seen that. So when we're born, we have all these T cells and B cells that are naive, not active yet, but waiting and poised to respond. And so like they're all made and ready to go, but they're waiting to see those antigens to become activated and for us to develop that memory. But repeat your question again, because I think I will answer part of what was embedded in your question. So when a T cell finds a new antigen yeah. and creates antibodies to remember it, yeah. are new T cells for that antigen also created? That's a great question. So what ends up happening is, in this case, we'll say that this MHC2 expressing cell is, uh, is a B cell. It is the antigen, it is chewed it up and is up on MHC class two. What ends up happening 
is it's found its top that recognizes that antigen. So this cell binds to that antigen as an antibody on the surface. It's an antigen receptor binds only to that antigen. Now that presented peptide. So here it's seeing the whole thing. The T cell is only seeing the peptide up and presented. And so now. To secrete cytokines that's going to communicate and help B cells to become more activated and pump out more antibodies. This T cell is going to get on the order of 20 doublings, I think. And so you're going to have now you're going to have a ton of antibodies cells. This and so you're going to go to the site of pathogens and help eliminate it. Then you've got a problem. Okay. No, that's a, that's a fair question. So we have trillions. The, the when, when we talk about the diversity of adaptive immunity, it is incredibly diverse. Where there are approximately a trillion different kinds of T cells made. Now we'll select out those that are autoreactive, and I don't think we'll get to it today. We'll probably get to it on Thursday, where we'll we'll, we'll delete those that are self-reactive, and we'll only want those that have that are equipped to, to respond. But our, our, um, our T cell repertoire is so diverse that if, does not, if it does not respond to an antigen, that means there's something wrong. That means there's probably an immunocompromised issue or some sort of uh, T cell dysfunction where it's not equipped to respond to that, uh, to that pathogen. So in our closing minutes here, uh, what we have here is an image illustrating how MHC class two, and forgive me for my color blindness, yellow, uh, is presenting a peptide to this T cell receptor. This is CD4 uh, actually engaging with the base of MHC class two here. So it's physically associating with MHC class two on this APC antigen presenting cell. I'm going to stop there. Uh, so I will be here with any questions and thanks for your time.